be talking to us today about stepping out into your authentic self. I like the, the, the stepping out, it's sort of like a dance in a way. Uh, and it, I've been thinking about uh, what is an authentic self and how he's going to get us be doing that in a half an hour. And I, I really can't wait. So um, Warren has just become the co-minister of the Unity of Independence uh, with his husband, David, uh, who we have also heard from quite a bit. So congratulations on that, Warren, and take it away. Let me uh, All right. stop the share so that you can come in. And if you want to uh, uh, put on uh, speaker view, uh, which can be done in the, up in the right-hand corner for those of you on a laptop, I don't know how it happens in other ways, but so you can see Warren and his office there. So I'm at it. And Jeff, will you allow me to share my screen? Absolutely. Hold on. So while he's doing that, I just want to thank Barb and thank all of you for inviting me back. It's a treat to speak with you all. There you go. All right. Can everyone see that all right? Yep, yeah, okay, awesome. Well, I want to uh, start out my talk today by reading a fairly long excerpt of a book um, called The Sacred Yes. It's Letters from the Infinite, Volume 1, by Reverend Deborah L. Johnson. Authenticity is really the only thing that people need to know about in this human realm. Everything stems from it. The healing is really about finding their authentic selves. The transformation too is really about authenticity. The creativity, love, everything of any value is really about finding one's own authenticity and giving it expression. You've become overly concerned with the expression aspect and have not paid enough attention to the authenticity aspect. When you do consider your authenticity, you freeze because you don't know how you'll be able to express it. Your authentic self is the place of integration of your spirituality and your humanity. In this place, your human expressions are a reflection of both your individual uniqueness and your understanding of yourself as a spiritual being incarnate in a body who is one with the whole. Now I have some rust slides in here, they're blank, that's on purpose, so I don't think that there's anything wrong. I find myself contemplating the number three a lot in my daily life and multiples of three, especially like the numbers nine and 12. The number three may be obviously because it's an expression of the Trinity, you know, um, God, Christ, Spirit, or metaphysically we might say divine mind, idea, expression. The number nine, well, just because it's three squared. And then the number 12, because it's three times four. Twelve expresses as the set of the original disciples or the 12 tribes of Israel. It represents spiritual completeness. And then the number four represents a foundation, a place from which to begin. As I observe life around me, I seek out and I find expressions of trinities all the time. For me, they just seem to show up about everywhere. You know, photographers set their cameras on tripods and these three-legged stands provide support and stability. Stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And often, each one of those also have a beginning, middle, and end within them. There's that three times three. 
Warren, your screen is blank right now. I don't know if there's supposed to be something up on the screen, but it's blank right now. No, I, it is that's intentional. So I have some rest screens where I'm not talking without having to interrupt and stop the screen share and start again. So it's intentional. So, and, and then returning to this idea of threes, much of the music that we listen to has three beats per measure. A few weeks ago, I came across the Latin phrase, omne trium perfectum, and excuse my, uh, my, my accent there, but that means that everything that comes as th in threes is perfect or complete. Me personally, I tend to think of groups of threes as trinities, but really that's usually a holy set of three. Other words to describe threes are trio, triad, trilogy. Now, given the attention that I paid to number three, it won't come as a surprise that eventually I was going to write a talk about the three aspects of our being. Those three aspects make up the totality of who we really are. And we really need to embrace all three of these aspects in a balanced and harmonious way to express our most authentic self. Now, of course, most obviously, we have the physical body. And I would include in that the material world around us. Then we have our mental, emotional selves. In other words, the mind. And then we have that spiritual self. Now, some of you may call this our highest self, the divine self. I tend to usually call it the Christ self. We have a relationship with each of these three aspects of our being. Now, most of us, we can easily relate to our bodies. No, we may be highly critical and judgmental about them, and especially when we're experiencing a health challenge. But, you know, others of us might have a fantastic relationship with our bodies where we understand that our bodies are the very temple of the living expression of God that we are. And most of us also have a relationship with our mind, that realm of thinking and feeling. Although again, some people are challenged with that relationship, finding a healthy way to relate to their own mind and the way that it functions. For example, some people believe that every single thought that they have is true. And they, and they also might engage in all or nothing thinking. Some believe that when they have a feeling, like maybe they're not feeling so great, they believe that they will never ever feel better. And they may not understand that everything that we experience in this world is really just temporary. And I've experienced this myself a lot. Some people may just feel overwhelmed and especially when life throws just way too many curveballs at us all at the same time. And of course, other people have found healthy ways to relate to their minds, understanding that they are not their thoughts, that thoughts just come and go like the clouds in the sky. And they've also mastered their feelings, realizing that they may feel a certain way in the moment, but they are not that feeling. In other words, they have the feeling the feeling does not have them. But what about when it comes to relating to our Christ self? Some of us may not understand at all, let alone be able to relate to this divine aspect of our being. Now, regardless, it's there, it resides within us as the perfection that we are. But intentionally or unintentionally at times, We've divorced ourselves from it, allowing our awareness of it to go dormant, let alone actually live our lives from it. Now, at other times, we might just outright reject this divine aspect of ourselves, thinking because of something that we may have done or whatever. How can I possibly have any kind of divinity within me at all? And this may be especially true for those of us who came from more traditional backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and were new to unity or other new thought principles. Now, many verses exist in the gospel where Jesus talks about our divine self. 
And one such story is in the parable of the prodigal son. In his book, Discover the Power Within You, Union Minister Eric Butterworth says this about the parable. You will recall that when the son finally came to himself out in the far country, he suddenly saw himself in a larger context and he came home. He was free. He had released his greater potential. For the prodigal son, being out in the far country is that place in mind where he wasn't aware of his highest self. But when he finally came to himself, he literally came to the awareness of that high self. In Colossians 1, verse 27, is a simple, fantastic reminder. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We cannot possibly step into our authentic selves and be who we truly are without embracing our spiritual nature, our Christ, our high self. And I have to apologize for a second. I, I got a little lost with my PowerPoint here, so let me get caught up. Um, Eckhart Tolle says, when you, know, when you know who you truly are, there is an abiding, a live sense of peace. You could call it joy, because that's what joy is. Vibrantly alive peace. It is the joy of knowing yourself as the very life essence before life takes on form. That is the joy of being, of being who you truly are. This is why we want to take this huge step in defining who we truly are authentically and expressing our authentic selves. I love the Conversations with God books by Neil Donald Walsh. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. But in book one, Neil Donald Walsh addresses this. There is only one purpose for all life, and that is for you and all that lives to experience fullest glory. Everything else you say, think, or do is attendant to that function. There is nothing else for your soul to do and nothing else your soul wants to do. The wonder of this purpose is that it is never ending. An ending is a limitation, and God's purpose is without such a boundary. Should there come a moment in which you experience yourself in your fullest glory, you will, in that instant, imagine an even greater glory to fulfill. The more you are, the more you can become. And the more you can become, the more you can yet be. When we're willing to step into our authentic selves, we experience freedom, peace, joy, a sense of well-being, and most importantly, a sense of rightness. But stepping out into our authentic selves can be really challenging to do. We all have our own barriers to expressing and experiencing our authentic selves. So what are some of those? Well, one barrier I think that some people have is that they allow their egos to become so inflated that just one well-placed dart pops it and it exposes it for the fraud that it is. In my opinion, we don't have to look far into the world to see examples of that. These people believe that they are strong, excellent, and by God, they are going to speak authentically so whatever pops into their minds comes through their lips with no filter whatsoever. This is not what I'm talking about when I think of true authenticity. True authenticity has compassion for and it has an understanding of the fact that words and actions can and do result in harm. True authenticity acts in the highest good of all, not just in the interests of itself. Another barrier that 
many of us have, and this one I can definitely relate to myself, is thinking that we're not good enough or comparing ourselves to others. Now, um, some of you may know that I'm an introvert. So speaking before an audience or a congregation used to be a real challenge for me. And in some cases, it still is. When I began my path to ministry and all throughout my education, and even now, I'll observe other ministers giving a lesson. And I'm so often amazed at the apparent ease, the grace that they have, the storytelling, the bringing together of just the right and perfect gesture at the right and perfect time that hits home the words or the phrases that they use. And when I observe that, that's what go through my mind. Well, I can never be that. I can't ever give a lesson like that. And you know what? Those thoughts are right, but not in the critical way that my ego intends. They are right because I am created with my own set of talents, gifts, and patterns. And I have to trust that my words and the way that I deliver them will reach the people that they're supposed to reach. And I also have to be brave enough to face that inner critic that tells me that my talk will be a flop, that no one's going to be able to relate to it. That's the classic, I'm not good enough. You see, God desires to express in, as, and through us if we will but allow it to. God does this through the unique gifts and talents we're born with and that we acquire over time. And those, those are unique to us. And just as every snowflake has a unique crystalline structure that's one of a kind, our gifts and talents will never ever be repeated again in another person exactly the way they are in us. The Apostle Paul writes about our gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit. And there are varieties of services with the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Where in your own life do you wish to express your authentic self that you get stopped cold by comparing yourself to others or tell yourself that you're not good enough? Here's another common barrier. It goes along the lines of, oh man, it's just too hard, or it's gonna take too long. I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too busy, I'm too fill in the blank. I'll never forget this. Uh, an old mentor, a teacher of mine was fond of saying, if you want to know what you are really committed to, take a look around you. There's a sort of raw honesty in conducting such an assessment, but when we do it, it can really wake us up to what's going on in our subconscious minds. It helps us to expose our excuses, our ingrained habits and ways of being. It gives us the opportunity to commit to something else, our true authenticity. Not only does being truly authentic require dropping of old habits and beliefs that no longer serve who we are, it can require a dedication and a willingness to grow into who we really are. I came across um, something in Discover the Power Within You by Eric Butterworth that I'm going to share with you now. The great pianist Paderewski was giving a command performance for a royal family in Europe. After his concert, a duchess came to him bubbling with enthusiasm and said, Maestro, you are a genius. He replied, ah, yes. But before I was a genius, I was a clod. 
In other words, the moment of genius was the result of years of discipline and overcoming and practice, practice, practice. Another classic barrier we have is what will others think? This is another one that I can really relate to. Many of us at a really young age were indoctrinated into worrying about what others think about us and trying to please others at the expense of ourselves. That is a surefire way of not being true to who we really are. And it severely limits how our capital S self desires to express into the world. But when we look inward instead of outward, we tap into something far greater. Here's another um, excerpt from Reverend Johnson. To see yourself in God is to take yourself to a place of no limitation, of greater possibilities. Your authenticity is a place of pure potential. Even you have no idea of the all that you are capable of, and you will never find it by clinging to the approval of others or even of yourself. If I had only one word to sum up all of these barriers that I've been talking about today, these barriers that keep us from being authentic, it's fear. That's the bottom line. All of these barriers to expressing and being our true authentic selves is a specific form of fear. So to be authentic, we have to face our fears and be willing to step out into our authentic self despite them. You cannot learn about and express your true self if you're always staying within your comfort zone. And I'll be honest, that's been a challenge for me to learn that lesson in my life. I love my comfort zone. But in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, says in part, be strong and bold. Have no fear or dread, because it is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Okay, so far we've talked about stepping out into our authentic selves and mind, body, and spirit, why we want to be authentic, and even some of the barriers that we encounter along the way. Now I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about some of the spiritual tools that we have at our disposal that can have us step out and into our authentic selves. These selves that in inside we truly long to be. Now, some of you are probably familiar with Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore's teachings that we are each created with 12 divine gifts of mind or powers of mind. In today's language, I like to think of these 12 gifts as capacities or capabilities of our minds. We're always using these gifts, whether we're aware of them or not. Today, I'm gonna to briefly touch on just four of them and how we could use them to step into and out into our authenticity. The first is faith. Faith is defined in the dictionary as trust belief, or conviction. We use faith all of the time, but we must constantly ask ourselves, what am I putting my faith in? Is it my own innermost divine self, or am I putting my faith in the things of the physical world? When you start to listen to the voice of your highest self, for that guidance, instead of looking to the physical world, you're demonstrating spiritual faith. My speaking with you here today is the result of a huge leap of faith. My embarking on this ministerial path, even now, presents me with situations that are completely unknown to me. Yet I choose to step out in faith into being more of who I truly am. My question to you is, what is it you dream of doing or being that would reflect your authentic self 
And then what is just one small step you could take towards that today? The next capacity I want to touch on is strength. Strength in this case is not physical strength. It is the ability to persevere, just as that pianist. He went from a musical clod to a genius. The strength that I'm talking about, it's not only perseverance, but it's also the ability to stand in your own convictions and opinions. Using myself as an example of this again, when I'm done with my 10 hour workday at Children's Mercy, I often feel really tired. And the last thing that my ego wants to do is spend any time engaging in ministry or even any other aspect of my life. I just want to go sit my rear end down and watch TV. But relying on the power of strength, that strength that's within me, helps me to persevere. It helps me to find the reserves to engage in those activities. And it also allows me to stand firm with my ego that I am on the right path. And especially if that's true, my ego just wants to throw in the towel. The next one is love. The faculty of love is the attracting power. And in the context of today's talk, it's also a feeling power. We have to marry our feelings with our intellect. And used rightly, it can help us make wise, loving choices. Two choices come to us from Neil Donald Walsh. There's only one reason to do anything as a statement to the universe of who you really are. In other words, when we do something, we're doing something because we want to tell God, we want to tell our family, our friends, this is who I really am. Used in this way, life becomes self-creative. You use life to create yourself as who you are and who you've always wanted to be. The other choice we have is to undo something. There's also only one reason to undo anything because it is no longer a statement of who you want to be. It does not reflect you. It does not represent you. When you're making a decision as to whether a certain action or choice represents your authentic self, check into your heart space right here. Close your eyes. How does your heart feel? How does your body feel? Does it agree with your head? If so, you're on the right track. And the last capacity of mind I want to uh, bring up to you all today is imagination. The power of imagination allows us to visualize in great detail something that we would like to manifest. It can be used literally to create something in the material world from the invisible world of pure possibility. It's like watching a movie in your mind's eye. What kind of movies are you watching? Are they positive and uplifting? Do they move you toward who you authentically are? Or do they move you away from it? Here's one way we might use imagination for our authenticity. Deborah Johnson says, your authenticity is the place where you hear God's voice, feel God's presence, and move in God's spirit. It is the place where you experience genuineness. You may say that you have no idea what this feels like. You often say this when you're challenged to live in a more spiritual manner. You play ignorant as if you do not know what to do. Just because you've never experienced something before does not mean you cannot imagine what it would be like. The process of imagining is not about creating fantasies in your head. It is for the purpose of moving your attention to the possibility of it all. It is about enabling you to see from another perspective. If you are too afraid to imagine something other than what you have experienced as true in the past, then you have set your own upper limit future. Now the next spiritual 
tool that I'm going to talk about for how we can step out and into our authentic selves you're not going to be surprised about. It's using prayer and meditation, but specifically using denials and affirmations during that time. Now, I think of prayer as the active part of communing with my Christ self. And two powerful ways to pray, again, are through the use of denials and affirmations. Let's start with denials first. A lot of people totally misunderstand denials. When we use a denial, we're not saying that a particular fact or a particular situation does not exist. But what we are denying is the power of that situation or that circumstance to rob us of our joy or our good. We might also want to deny the permanence of a situation. An example of a denial for helping us to find our authentic self might be, I give no power to my old belief that I'm unworthy of God's love. In prayer, we use affirmations of truth to remind us of who we truly are and what our potential is. Now, an affirmation should always follow a denial because you want to replace what you just denied with a spiritual truth. And what I mean by a spiritual truth is seeing something as God sees it, which is perfection, which is good. An example of an affirmation that you could use is, my high self now reveals to me my true authentic nature and guides me in how to use it in service to myself and others. And of course, meditation is the other side of the coin to prayer. Can it's you use passive part where we listen to our high self or Christ. And some people believe that meditation, you're not supposed to have any thoughts. You know, it's supposed to be this blissful thing. It's just the opposite. But when we're meditating, we just allow to come up, to come up and to pass on by. Meditation takes practice. If you don't have an active practice now, just start out regularly by spending a minute and expand that each day until you're spending more and more time in meditation. Now I'm going to conclude my talk with one more quote from Neil Donald Walsh, or excerpt, I should say. Accept who and what you are right now and demonstrate that. This is what Jesus did. It's the path of the Buddha, the way of Krishna, the walk of every master who's appeared on the planet. And every master likewise has had the same message. What I am, you are. What I can do, you can do. These things and more shall you also do. You say it is difficult to walk the path of Christ, to follow the teachings of the Buddha, to hold the light of Krishna, to be a master. Yet I tell you this, it is far more difficult to deny who you are than to accept it. You, you are goodness and mercy and compassion and understanding. You are peace and joy and light. You are forgiveness and patience, strength and courage, a helper in time of need, a comforter in time of sorrow a healer in time of injury, a teacher in times of confusion. You are the deepest wisdom and the highest truth, the greatest peace and the grandest love. You are these things. And in moments of your life, you have known yourself as these things. Choose now to know yourself as these things always. Let's now prepare ourselves for a time of prayer and meditation. So I invite you to just get comfortable in your chair or your seat, feet flat on the floor. Take in a slow, deep breath and release. If you haven't already, close your eyes. Take in another deep breath and gently release. 
One more breath in and release. We are immersed in and have our being in the one power, one presence, one life, one love, one intelligence, one wisdom that goes by many names, God, divine mind, spirit, Christ. That inner wisdom, inner love, guides us in the ways of our true selves. If you wish, let my words become your words as you silently repeat them to yourself. Grounded in faith, guided by love, fueled by strength, using imagination to see new possibilities, I seek find and know my authentic self. I carefully and lovingly care for my body, mind, and spirit. Peace and quiet now fill my mind and body. In this moment, I am aware that my body is the temple of the living God. My mind is a receptacle for divine ideas. My spirit is the great I am. A knowledge and understanding of my authentic self is now awakened in me. I know who I really am, who I am creating myself to be, as I go now to a few moments of silent meditation. Sweet, sweet spirit, thank you for this sacred time, this sacred space, this time to reflect on living an authentic life, one that allows our divine selves to express daily, one that allows us to experience peace and joy no matter what the outer experience is telling us. For this and so much more, we are grateful. We are grateful for this time of togetherness, this time of divine awareness. In the nature of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Warren. You're welcome. I loved how you took the, the unity principles and wove them into uh, the, the, the topic, I guess, the, 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 the way in which we are authentic. And it, I mean, it, it really brings the, those together with our higher self and, and how we behave. So that was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. Could you uh, give me back being host? You can go up to the um, upper right hand corner where there's names and you find Center for Universal Oneness. Uh, 
and then uh, click on more. You see that? You should be the host now, Jeff. Okay, thank you. 